Yeah. Let's talk about all the risks from bad human actors using AI. There's cyber attacks. So between 2023 and 2024, they increased by about a factor of 12, 1,200%. And that's probably because these large language models make it much easier to do phishing attacks. And a phishing attack, for anyone that doesn't know, is... It's, they send you something saying, uh, hi, I'm your friend John and I'm stuck in El Salvador. Could you just wire this money? That's one kind of attack. Yeah. But the phishing attacks are really trying to get your login credentials. And now with AI, they can clone my voice, my image. They can do all that. I'm struggling at the moment because there's a bunch of AI scams on X and also Meta. And there's one in particular on Meta, so Instagram, Facebook at the moment, which is a paid advert where they've taken my voice from the podcast. They've taken the, my mannerisms and they've made a new video of me encouraging people to go and take part in this crypto Ponzi scam or whatever. And we've been, you know, we spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and end emailing Meta, telling, please take this down. They take it down, another one pops up. They take that one down, another one pops up. So it's like whack-a-mole. Yes, and then very annoying. The, the heartbreaking part is you get the messages from people that have fallen for the scam and right. they've lost 500 pounds or $500. And they're and crossed with you because you recommended it. And I'm, I'm like, I'm <laughs> sad for them. It's very annoying. Yeah. I have a, a smaller version of that, which is some people now publish papers with me as one of the authors. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's in order that they can get lots of citations to themselves. Um, so cyber attacks, a very real threat. There's been an explosion yes. of those. And these already, obviously, AI is very patient. So they can go through 100 million lines of code looking for known ways of attacking them. That's easy to do. But they're going to get more creative. And they may, some people believe, and I, some people who know a lot believe that maybe by 2030, they'll be creating new kinds of cyber attacks, which no person ever thought of. So that's very worrisome. Because they can think for themselves and discover new ways to They can think for themselves. They can draw new conclusions from much more data than a person ever saw. Is there anything you're doing to protect yourself from cyber attacks at all? Yes. It's one of the few places where I changed what I do radically because I'm scared of cyber attacks. Canadian banks are extremely safe. In 2008, no Canadian banks came anywhere near going bust. Mm -hmm. So they're very safe banks because they're well regulated, fairly well regulated. Nevertheless, I think a cyber attack might be able to bring down a bank. Now, if you have all my savings are in shares in banks, held by banks. So if the bank gets attacked and it holds your shares, they're still your shares. And so I think you'd be okay unless the attacker sells the shares because the bank can sell the shares. If the attacker sells your shares, I think you're screwed. I don't know. I mean, maybe the bank would have to try and reimburse you, but the bank's bust by now, right? So, mm -hmm. so I'm worried about a Canadian bank being taken down by a cyber attack and the attacker selling, selling shares that it holds. So I spread my money, my children's money between three banks in the belief that if a cyber attack takes down one Canadian bank, the other Canadian banks will very quickly get very careful. And do you have a phone that's not connected to the internet? Do you have any, like, you know, I'm thinking about storing data and stuff like that. Do you think it's wise to consider having cold storage? I have a little disk drive and I back up my laptop on this hard drive. Mm -hmm. So I actually have everything on my laptop on a hard drive. At least, you know, if the whole internet went down, I had the sense I still got it on my laptop and I still got my information. Yeah. Then the next thing is using AIs to create nasty viruses. Okay. And the problem with that is that requ just requires one crazy guy with a grudge. One guy who knows a little bit of molecular biology, knows a lot about AI, and just wants to destroy the world you can now create new viruses relatively cheaply using AI. And you don't have to be a very skilled molecular biologist to do it. And that's very scary. So you could have a small cult, for example. And a small cult might be able to raise a few million dollars. For a few million dollars, they might be able to design a whole bunch of viruses. Well, I'm thinking about some of our foreign adversaries doing government-funded programs. I mean, there was lots of talk around COVID and Wu, the Wuhan laboratory and what they were doing in gain-of-function research. But I'm wondering if in, you know, China or a Russia or an Iran or something, 
the government could fund a, a program for a small group of scientists to make a virus that they could, you know? I think they could, yes. Now, they'd be worried about retaliation. They'd be worried about other governments doing the same to them. Hopefully that would help keep it under control. They might also be worried about the virus spreading to their country. Okay. Then there's um, corrupting elections. Okay. So if you wanted to use AI to corrupt elections, a very effective thing is to be able to do targeted political advertisements where you know a lot about the person. So anybody who wanted to use AI for corrupting elections would try and get as much data as they could about everybody in the electorate. With that in mind, it's a bit worrying what Musk is doing at present in the States, going in and insisting on getting access to all these things that were very carefully siloed. The claim is it's to make things more efficient, but it's exactly what you would want if you intended to corrupt the next election. How do you mean? Because you get all this data on the You population. get all this data on people. Yeah. You know how much they make, where they live. You know everything about them. Once you know that, it's very easy to manipulate them. Because you can make an AI that... You can send messages um, that they'll find very convincing, telling them not to vote, for example. So I have no, no reason other than common sense to think this, but I wouldn't be surprised if part of the motivation of getting all this data from American government sources is to corrupt elections. Another part might be that it's very nice training data for a big model. But he would have to be taking that data from the government and feeding it into his... Yes. And what they've done is turned off lots of the security controls, got rid of the some of the organisation to protect against that. Um, so that's corrupting elections. OK. Then there's creating these two echo chambers by organisations like YouTube and Facebook showing people things that will make them indignant. People love to be indignant. Indignant as in angry? Or what does indignant mean? Feeling, I'm sort of angry, but feeling righteous. Okay. So, for example, if you were to show me something that said, Trump did this crazy thing, here's a video of Trump doing this completely crazy thing, I would immediately click on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so putting us in echo chambers and dividing us. Yes, and that's... Um, the policy that YouTube and Facebook and others use for deciding what to show you next is causing that. If they had a policy of showing you balanced things, they wouldn't get so many clicks and they wouldn't be able to sell so many advertisements. Definitely. And so it's basically the profit motive is saying, show them whatever will make them click. And what will make them click is things that are more and more extreme. And that confirmed my existing bias. And that confirmed my existing bias. So you're getting your biases confirmed all the time. Further and further For, and further yeah, and further, yeah. which means you're, you're driving which away Which is now there's in the States, there's two communities that don't hardly talk to each other. I'm not sure people realise that this is actually happening every time they open an app. But if you go on a TikTok or a YouTube or, or one of these big social networks, the algorithm, as you, you said, is designed to show you more of the things that you had interest in last time. So if you just play that out over 10 years, it's going to drive you further and further and further into whatever ideology or belief you have and further away from nuance and common sense and um, parity, which is a pretty remarkable thing. That I, I, like People don't know it's happening. They just open their phones and experience something and think this is the news or the experience everyone else is having. Right. So... Basically, if you have a newspaper and everybody gets the same newspaper, yeah. you get to see all sorts of things you weren't looking for. And you get a sense that if it's in the newspaper, it's an important thing or significant thing. But if you have your own news feed, my news feed on my iPhone, three quarters of the stories are about AI. <laughs> and I find it very hard to know if the whole world's talking about AI all the time or if it's just my news feed. <laughs> Okay, so driving me into my echo chambers, um, which is going to continue to divide us further and further. I'm actually noticing that the algorithms are becoming even more, what's the word, tailored. And people might go, oh, that's great. But what it means is they're becoming even more personalized, which is, is means that my reality is becoming even further from your yeah. reality. Yeah, it's crazy. We don't have a shared reality anymore. I share reality with other people who watch the BBC and other... BBC News and other people who read The Guardian and other people who read The New York Times. I have almost no shared reality with people who watch Fox News. 
It's pretty, it's pretty, um, I, I, it's worrisome. Yeah. Behind all this is the idea that these companies just want to make profit and they'll do whatever it takes to make more profit. Because they have to. They're legally obliged to do that. So we almost can't blame the company, can we? If they're, if that's... Well, capitalism's done very well for us. It's produced lots of goodies. Yeah. But you need to have it very well regulated. So what you really want is to have rules so that when some company is trying to make as much profit as possible, in order to make that profit, they have to do things that are good for people in general, not things that are bad for people in general. So once you get to a situation where in order to make more profit, the company starts doing things that are very bad for society, like showing you things that are more and more extreme, that's what regulations are for. So you need regulations with capitalism. Now, companies will always say regulations get in the way, make us less efficient, and that's true. The whole point of regulations is to stop them doing things to make profit that hurt society. And we need strong regulation. Who's going to decide whether it hurts society or not? Because, you know... That's the job of politicians. Unfortunately, if the politicians are owned by the companies, that's not so good. And also the politicians might not understand the technology. We've, you've probably seen the Senate hearings where they wheel out you know, Mark Zuckerberg and these big tech CEOs. And it is quite embarrassing because they're asking the wrong questions. Well, I've seen the video of the US Education Secretary talking about how they're going to get AI in the classrooms, except she thought it was called A1. She's actually there saying we're going to have all the kids interacting with A1. There is a school system that's going to start... Um making sure that first graders or even pre-Ks have A1 teaching, you know, every year starting, you know, that far down in the grades. And that's just a, that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> and these are, well, these are the people that... These are the people in charge. Ultimately, the tech companies are in charge because they were well, smart. The tech companies in the States now, at least a few weeks ago when I was there, they were running an advertisement about how it was very important not to regulate AI because it would hurt us in the competition with China. Yeah. And that's a, that's a plausible argument, no? Yes, it will. But you have to decide. Do you want to compete with China by doing things that will do a lot of harm to your society? And you probably don't. I guess they would say that it's not just China, it's Denmark and Australia and Canada and the yeah, UK. They're not, so, they're not so worried about. And Germany. But if they kneecapped themselves with regulation, if they slowed themselves down, then the founders, the entrepreneurs, the investors are going to go I invest. think calling it kneecapping is sort of yeah. taking a particular point of view. It's take, taking the point of view that regulations are sort of very harmful. What you need to do is just constrain the big companies so that in order to make profit, they have to do things that are socially useful. Like Google Search is a great example. That didn't need regulation because it just made information available to people. It was great. But then if you take YouTube, where it starts showing you adverts and showing you more and more extreme things, that needs regulation. But we don't have the people to regulate it, as we've identified. I think people know pretty well um, that particular problem of showing you more and more extreme things. That's a well-known problem that the politicians understand. They just um, need to get on and regulate it. So that was the, the next point, which was that the algorithms are going to drive us further into our echo chambers. Right. What's next? 